Hello, my name is Steve Kotze, and I am an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. Today I'll be interviewing Mr. Cleve Cornelison, Jr. on Friday, October 20th at the Sharonville Branch Library. Our camera operator is Nancy Wade. Tell us a little bit about your life before you entered the military. Well, I was born in Ray, Georgia, of somewhere around 1920. Uh, my dad was a railroader, and I would say that somewhere before 1922, he was transferred to Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, because that's where I found out I was on the census and living here then. And uh, from then on, I mean, uh, my life was a various stages of life on that. I was raised in the West End, uh, went to Sands, Dyer, and Bloom Junior High School. Uh, was there during the f 1937 flood. Uh, quite an experience of different things that happened in that. I mean, uh, don't know just exactly what all you want to know about, but we'll relate some of them. Uh, That's okay. Now, you enlisted in the Navy in September 1942? Yeah. Yep. How, how did you come to pick the Navy? Uh, I, was, I worked at, uh, uh, as an electrician's helper at Wright Aeronautical in that, and my, you want to call him my mentor, but my electrician I worked with in that was a retired submariner from World War I. And all he talked about every day was was the Navy and that. I mean, he never talked about anything else but the Navy. And he kept going on and on and on and on about it and that. And all of my friends and that uh, were, were being drafted or volunteering and that. And there was nobody else around there and that. And I was had a job where I could do, could be deferred. He kept telling me that that I had, I wouldn't have to serve and that. But it just got so lonesome and that that I decided it was about time to to get in there and get with the rest of them and that. So, so I just uh, went in and volunteered and decided to go in. And uh, I thought I was volunteering in the Navy and that, and the guy says, no, we're taking everybody in what they call a V6 program now and that. And uh, so that was the reserve program at the time, I understand. So, so that's where I wound up going then. But I was still going on active duty, though. So. Now, how did, the, how did the actual enlistment work? Did you did you go to a particular office at a particular time? Went to, a, to an office down in downtown Cincinnati. It was a naval recruiting office in that, and uh, they did a lot of talking about the Navy and that there too and that. And actually, I mean, the, the war was going on in that, and uh, they wanted to know just the, any experiences you had in that. And I told them that I graduated from Electrical High School and that and stuff. And they, they said, well. Uh, they don't have any openings now, so, but they'll still take me in the Navy and that, and so is a seaman in that, so so they shipped me off to Great Lakes and um, I think it was in October, I believe, I'm not sure, some September, October, and uh, that's where I was until I had made my six weeks training, I think it was, they said, but I think it wound up in four weeks. But, uh, <laughs> what, else, what else do you remember about training at Great Lakes? It was cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody says. <laughs> and uh, windy, and uh, but it was all right. I really enjoyed it too. I really enjoyed the uh, uh, situation in that. It was very uh, pleasing. I mean, they had a good good group of people I was with in that. And actually, you always have positive and negative things happen, but that they're not very really important in your life, though. <laughs> you know. Well, what was the toughest part of the training? Do you think? The toughest part of the training was that uh, I had volunteered for submarine service in that, but they said at the time they were not taking any in the submarine service, uh, and that I would go in what they called a uh, replacement uh, company, and I didn't know what that was going to be or just what it was going to happen, so I said, well, I'm here, I can't go any go anyplace else, so we'll go there. So, okay. Um, they still hadn't decided that you would become an electrician at that time. No, no, they did not. So what happened after basic? How did how did you find your first post? Where did you go after basic? 
After basic training in that, uh, they sent, sent me to Bremerton, Washington, and uh, I thought maybe that's where my sign would be. I would get a ship from there and that, and when we got there and that, uh, they told us, the, uh, the group I was with and that, that uh, we were going on to the USS Tennessee. Well, uh, she was in there from Pearl Harbor because she had been damaged quite a bit in Pearl Harbor and that, and we thought, well, that must be what we're going to wind up on that, but they, they put us in a work detail in that, and all we did was work work on it, getting her ready to go back because she was still pretty well damaged in that. And uh, we knew she would go back, but we didn't know when or how long we would be there. And from there, then they decided that uh, what they had done, they had accomplished that in uh, December then, they told us that we were going to be shipped to uh, Kodiak, Alaska in, uh, for temporary assignments up there. When I got up there, I found out that, that uh, Kodiak, Alaska was a submarine base, and uh, the ship I went on that they assigned me temporary duty to uh, after I was there a while, and that was to the um, AMC, which was a coastal minesweeper. They were, were sweeping the Aleutian Islands and that, to just the harbors and that, to make sure that our ships could get in and out without any problem with that. Because the Japanese had laid quite a few mines up through that area, too. Uh, I was there, I guess, probably, oh, I guess probably so eight months or so, or maybe ten months. I don't know just the exact time, but um, after that, the uh, electricians came back, uh, the electrician came back from emergency leave and that, it was on this uh, AMC and that, so I was transferred back to the submarine base then while he was there, and I finished out a little time at the submarine base, and then actually they moved us to Dutch Harbor then, and there I was at the operating base at Dutch Harbor, which was a naval operating base, but it was also a submarine, came in there for different things and that, and uh, got there, and I thought, well, this is finally going to get something now, and I wound up at the Naval Air Station then. Uh, they sent me over there and said that's where I was going to be, and I was under a chief torpedo man over there, and we worked on the magnetic torpedo because they were having trouble in cold water with the magnetic torpedoes. They couldn't get them to function right, and he was quite a quite an individual. I mean, he had been in World War One in that, and uh, uh, to, to have a torpedo man uh, is is a little bit different than somebody else. I mean, because being from World War One too, and but um, he was a very smart individual in that, and we worked on this magnetic torpedo for I don't know how long in that. We finally found some problems with it and that, and uh, then they sent me back over to the sub base and that, and said they didn't need me over to the air station anymore. I'd go back to the sub base, and from there, then they decided that uh, it was time to move on. So I was assigned to this PC then, which is a patrol craft. And I believe the number was 1077. I'm not sure. I think that's uh, with the number on it. Uh, I was on there for quite a while in that. And uh, then we heard that uh, everything was secured in the illusions, but a few little mop up situations in that uh, out around Kiska and Attu and that. And that uh, uh, the PC was going to be transferred. To the south, to the South Pacific or Central Pacific, and that it would be, and uh, so we were all happy about that. But then the orders came through, and that that uh, I was not going to leave with it. That uh, they had some other ones that they were going to transfer with. So I was back on the base, and the other one guys got duty on there, and they went to the South, South I'd say South Pacific, probably down in that area, and uh, we never did hear exactly where they were wound up. But uh, we did hear that they were uh, somewhere around the Marshall Islands and that, so it had to be on the Central Pacific, I think. But um, so I was finished time there at uh, Dutch Harbor. Then I was there. Oh, all told, I mean, about uh, two and a, two and a half years. I mean, between Kodiak and Dutch Harbor, and Attu and ships I was on and that and stuff like that. Well, now let's get back to that first ship you were on, that coastal minesweeper. Right. They weren't generally very big ships. 
Uh, coastal mine sweeper, sweepers, I understand that they were uh, boats that were confiscated from the tuna fisher uh, that uh, had them uh, on the, on the uh, west coast. I mean, they used them to go out for catching tuna fish back in peace times and that. And they were all wooden hull and that, and therefore that made them really ideal for uh, early mine detection and that until they could come up with something better because metal uh, ships were just not feasible for uh, degaussing and that at the time. And then they came through with the degaussing system and that, and they started making them all metal and that, except the Next one up but, uh, from the coastal mine sweeper, they had what they called a, a yard mine sweeper, which is a, a little bit bigger, but they, they manufactured those themselves and that made them. Wow. And uh, then from then on, actually, they went to the bigger ones, the fleet uh, mine sweepers and that. But, uh, but here you were a fellow from the Midwest, probably never been on anything bigger than a rowboat, and they send you off to sea in a, in a relatively small boat. That must have been. I mean, you went from working on the Tennessee, which was a huge battleship, to this little tiny vessel in Alaskan waters where the Japanese weren't all that far away. How'd you feel about going to, to sea in such a small boat? Not knowing, not knowing much of anything. I mean, you didn't have much feeling anyway. You just did what they told you to do. I think the surprising thing was, though, that when we would go out on patrols and that, and uh, up to the Bering Sea and things like that, the uh, entire deck of that was covered with, with ice. I mean, it'd be five or six or seven, ten inches thick on the guns and that. And I don't see how, how we could have ever fired them if we had to on that. But uh, I assure you that uh, they were kept in operating condition, uh, chipping ice and that and stuff. But actually, being electricians, uh, then I was not on the top side with the deck crew and that. And I was always below decks, but um, they were really busy in that uh, on it. it. It was quite an experience on the PC because we were naturally overcrowded, and my bunking quarters happened to be in a galley, so on a on a hammock. So it's, 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 <laughs> so it was quite an experience. I mean, and uh, I can remember a couple of the Willie Was that they call him up there. I mean, it came through on that. that uh, Quite an experience on, on something really small in that when you find out that the lockers are being torn off of the bulkheads and that because of the storm and that and stuff. It was really quite an experience. And uh, did you yeah. have any trouble with seasickness? No, uh, well, probably at first. I mean, I think every, everybody, I think, at first time usually gets seasick. And they didn't have any what they call a, a seasickness pill like they got today and, or air sickness and everything else. But then they didn't have, If they had them, nobody got them. So, but, uh, how long were the patrols usually you went out on? It usually depended, I mean, it, it, uh, I think it more depended on how quick the weather changed than anything else, because we were small in that, and we couldn't be out there when these willy walls were hitting in that, because it was just like a hurricane or something back here in the, in the States here and that. The only difference was up there it was all cold, there was nothing, nothing warm about them, and uh, uh, they could hit. 10 minutes and be gone, and 15 minutes, and 15 minutes later, you'd have another one come through. So it was just one of those things that's just off and on. And, um, I understand from my experience in that up there and that and talking to people, and I have a friend of mine now that uh, served up there as a weatherman in that, and it's the toughest part of the world to detect the weather and how it's going to be because of the will it was, how they <coughs> formulate in a hurry in that. Disappear. You brought with you uh, some of your gear that you wore up in Alaska, but that doesn't seem terribly thick. Now, how did you stay warm? This was just an outer layer that you wore? That was the outer layer. You had a jacket that uh, uh, was more uh, more like a fleece line jacket, I call it, call it a day or something like that. And uh, this was your outer uh, weather gear that you put on when you were going if you, uh, on top side or anything like that on the base or anything like that. You had to wear those or else you bundle up to keep keep warm. I mean, it uh, it, uh, it was more so on the ships than anything else. I mean, uh, I'm sure that the Navy station had a lot of them that uh, guys had to wear them when they were working outside in that. But uh, uh, all I can say about it was it was the heaviest outfit I ever had in my life on. I mean, when you put it on top of the rest of your clothes you had on that. Now, you were in Kodiak for quite some time. I don't know just exactly 
what my period of time was there. They didn't, and, uh, I don't remember it, but uh, uh, I was there probably, I'd say probably nine months probably or so. Or, now, was that a, a fairly normal tour, or did you see a lot of people come and go in that period of time? No. You didn't see a lot of people come and go unless, unless they had an emergency back in the States or something. I mean, you were permanently assigned there and that. that uh, uh, there were a lot of TADs, which was temporary duty, but they were waiting for either a ship to come in or something like that, or just what they were going to do in that. And being a submarine base, we had more submariners there than we had anything else. Um, now, she when we moved to Dutch Harbor, and it was just the opposite. I mean, we had a lot of people operating there, and that. we had a lot of Seabees up in that area. And, uh, Actually, we had the Air, the Air Force was up there too, the Army and that. So it was quite a, quite a big station. What, what's the thing you remember most about Dutch Harbor? You know, there weren't a lot of people that got the chance to serve at Dutch Harbor. I think probably the conditions in Dutch Harbor, and the, the further out as you extend it, I mean, Kodiak it was not the best of conditions, but Dutch Harbor was not was a little bit worse. And if you moved out to ADAC and I too and that, it was worse, still worse than that. And Kiska and that, if you, uh, they call about um, uh, tundra, and you never knew what that was until you tried to step on it. Well, you're not walking on something you step on; it goes up to, over your ankle or something like that, and sometimes up to your knee. I mean, and uh, it uh, just the ground is just something different altogether. Just you can't believe it. You have to have to be there to experience it. What was the biggest challenge for an electrician on those kind of conditions? I'm sorry? What was the biggest challenge for you as an electrician in those kinds of conditions? Between the cold weather and the wet and the tundra, it's just not the same as being an electrician under normal circumstances. Well, the biggest challenge was, I mean, that you, you had to keep the ship going and that and see that uh, everything around and that. You had your watches to stand, uh, your the duties to do. I mean. Uh, I can remember, the thing I remember most about the AMC and that is that uh, uh, you didn't have a normal shift, if you want to call it that. I mean, uh, you were on call t 24 hours and that, but you still had your watches to stand to. And that seemed to be on uh, every ship I went on, and, uh, ex except, well, the PC was not quite that bad because they had abundance of crew. But uh, the AMC, I think we, I don't know, we had something like maybe 40 people at the most, I mean, that, yeah, I would say on so. Now, when you were at, uh, when you were at uh, Dutch Harbor and you were working on the uh, torpedoes, you mentioned a fellow that had been in uh, World War I, but I think you also managed to get some of the problems straightened out with the torpedoes and eventually got a, a letter commending your work on the torpedoes, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, we we found out that some of the problem, I mean, that they were having that, and uh, uh, um, he and I both got a letter, letter of commendation and that from it, uh, from what we had done. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it solved the whole problem, but it was part of it, so then uh, uh, they were happy with it, and actually, I mean, we got split then, and uh, uh, I don't know just where he went, I'm sure he doesn't know where I went then. I mean, so it's just one of those things. That you never knew unless you met him again somewhere. I mean, you know, so where they were going. Well, you brought with you here a picture of your training class, right? Yeah, that was my. That was taken at Great Lakes. I mean, uh, if you hold uh, that side, I'll hold this side. That's. This is your Great Lakes training class. Right. Did you ever run into any of them again? Uh, only one. Uh, Don Ashmore is on there, and he was he from Blue Ash, Ohio, but I didn't know that at the time. Uh -huh. I found that out after I came out of the service, because he and, he and I belonged to the same church in that. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he also stayed, he was also stayed in the reserve, too. He, he was, oh, well, I, better, he was a, I think he was a pharmacist, I'm not sure. No. Louder. Louder? Oh, I'm sorry. But, Very uh, good. It's a wonderful group of guys. Yeah, it, uh, 
well, all their names are on the back, but I, I couldn't tell you where. I, I know that quite a few of them are gone, uh, that were lost in World War II, because we did find that out. It was, and you brought some other pictures with yeah. you, too. Yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of just you here. And then this is a picture of four fellas, and you're on the left in the back. You know who the other three are? Uh, I only know the, the the chief and the Frank Hauser was the chief on there, and that's the only one I can remember. I mean, on that picture, uh, I think I probably got it at home, but that, I wrote a lot down. And then here's you with two of your buddies. Yep. Yeah. Now, one of the other things you brought with you was was a knife. And before we began recording, you told us a little bit about that. But could you could you go over that story again? How you came to have that knife? Well, at Dutch Harbor, uh, while we were, I guess, waiting for a uh, uh, an assignment, different assignment, different orders, and that I don't know just what. But they came out one day and said they needed six volunteers. Uh, for a specific job, they didn't tell us what it was. They didn't tell us what it was in that, but they gave us the equipment that we would need in that and said that uh, they would call us when the time came in that. And I guess, uh, I'm guessing probably a week or two after that, they called us and told us that the project or whatever we were going to do had did not materialize because they didn't need us in that, and we would be assigned to something else in that. So then I was assigned back to the base and then back on the PC again. So uh, it was more or less a, a TAD situation quite a bit uh, when I was up in the uh, Dutch Harbor and Kodiak. Now, other so, than the knife, did they give you any equipment that maybe revealed what kind of an assignment it would be? Well, uh, they, they gave you a couple other things, but you had to give them back, I mean. So. Uh -oh. <laughs> But uh, uh, they gave you a sidearm and that and stuff and that, but um, those were only, uh, I think the reason they left us keep these is because they just had maybe so many of them, I don't know. But, uh, well, it's a wonderful remembrance. Yeah. So. Now another item you brought with you were the Japanese cigarettes there. How'd you come to have those? Well, I got these after, after being assigned to the uh, YP, uh, after leaving, leaving in Alaska, they sent me to Philadelphia uh, for, for trade. This? Yeah. There you go. They sent me to Philadelphia for training in that, and uh, I didn't know where I was going to wind up going in that, but they sent me to the refrigeration school in that. And I just had some kind of idea that I wasn't going to go back to a ship like I was on in that. Probably didn't need much refrigeration in that last. Didn't have, didn't have any on that. Not, not to carry food, <laughs> and so they sent, uh, sent me back to uh, the West Coast. And after our training in Philadelphia, and got out there, and they told us that uh, uh, we would be assigned to an APA, which was a troop carrying uh, tack transport net. And uh, I don't know what happened between that and where I wound up. But uh, we got orders saying that the APA was going to be delayed in that and not uh, we would be reassigned to something else in that, and that's why I wound up on the YP-644. And that, that was quite an experience. That was, and that is where these came from it, when I was on that. That was quite an experience to, to be on that. If, uh, if you really want to travel in the world today and really see something, I'd say take a YP and go across the ocean. Uh, well, it, I'm not much of a it's, sailor myself, and again, it's not a very big ship. It's about 132 feet long and about uh, 25, 29 feet wide. And when you're filled up completely, if you see the little, you see those little, little parts here, you're underwater completely, and when you go from, go from one place to the other, you walk walk what they call a gangplank because otherwise you can't walk on a deck because it's covered with water. So you're mostly underwater, like a submarine, <laughs> than you are anything else. So it's quite an experience. Now that hit a crew of how many? 
Uh, we had about 29 uh, on there. Uh, you have one of everything. You have one radio man, one electrician, uh, one uh, uh, quartermaster, and different rates in that. And then you had what they call firemen and seamen that helped you in that. And that's the way they did. So you had three, three officers was all over the pad. We had a lieutenant was a commanding officer, and the JG was the exec officer, and the uh, ensign uh, was the engineering officer, and that's the way they went from there on. I mean, it, and I, Chief Motor Mac at the time, and that was the uh, refrigerator, he handled all the refrigeration. He was quite an experienced uh, chief. I mean, his name was Chief Anderson, and he came from South Dakota, and he worked for a big packing place in South Dakota, so he knew refrigeration. And um, but, um, it was uh, quite an experience reading. I mean, you, you, it's hard to really describe something like that because you don't have a lot of people, so all of them do multiple jobs uh, in general quarters. Uh, I was not in the uh, on the switchboard and that. I was uh, on one of the guns. And that, so uh, so it, it was armed. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Oh yeah! It was armed, but not nothing real big. I mean, twenty millimeters was about the biggest we had, but. Uh, I think they figured that the Japs could sink that and it wouldn't make any difference. I mean, because no, I'm sure they had a reason. I mean, it. Uh, so, but, what was the primary responsibility? What was what was your mission most of the time? Our mission was to carry food into the small islands uh, in the Pacific, Central and South Pacific, and that because the larger refrigeration ships couldn't get in, and we only drew 13 foot loaded and uh, our draft and that. So. And all that coral reef around the islands and that, I mean, it was quite impossible for any big, larger ships to get in. And that's if you refrigeration and that. So we would go in as far as we could go then, in which would they could come out then on a flat boat and get us or get their food and that and stuff. But uh, uh, 13 foot of water is not not really a lot of water when you consider you're in the ocean and that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, some of those harbors are 40 and 50 foot deep. I mean, so what kind of harbors do you remember? Which which were some of the more interesting ones? Did you ever get shore leave? Oh, yeah. well, your shore leave and that always came get you, you didn't get all the way in to, to a pier and that. You, you get in as close as you could, and then they, they would send a boat out if you wanted to go on shore leave, if you want to call it that. I mean, they'd send a boat out, and you could get on it and go back in. But uh, shore leave was something that uh, I really don't know that anybody really experienced a, a great do a great lot of fun out of a shore, shore leave, really. I don't think they did, because there was nothing there. They were all small islands. Yeah, they were all, well, Iwo Jima. Uh, we went to uh, Kwajalein, Marshall Islands, the Bonins, uh, which was that too, and those in uh, Saipan and Tenian. I mean, they were, they were not huge islands like Pearl Harbor or anything like that. I mean, it, uh, they were more in a smaller group in that. Uh, Guam, I mean, we, uh, I don't know which was the biggest one I ever did really check up to find out, but. Uh, what was the most interesting one, did you remember? I think the most interesting one that, that I would say as far as uh, the war was concerned that I could see was Iwo Jima. Because Iwo Jima was nothing but all tunnels in that the whole island was strictly nothing but tunnels. I'm sure that they, uh, later on they found out Okinawa was the same way, but uh, I think their first experience was really at Iwo Jima with, with connecting tunnels from one end of the island to the other end of the island. I think it was only, I don't know, five mile island, that's all it was. I mean, uh, I think that was probably the most interesting island that I could say that I saw as far as noticing something. And uh, they weren't just tunnels 10 foot below the ground, I mean, they, they were 25 or 30 foot down. I mean, they, they were down pretty far. Cause, and when you go in one of them, I mean, they had bunkers on the side where the Japanese sentry would sleep a little. You just crawl up there and sleep in that, and then you go all the way down to where the general stayed and stuff like that. So it had quite an experience. Now, you, at the end of the war, you uh, were discharged in uh, 
45? Yeah, I was them? discharged from the, from active duty, but I was still in, in what you call the, the ready reserve at that. And, and then and then you stayed in the reserve I, until? Until I got, got out. Which was what year? Uh, well, let's see, 37 years, uh, it would probably be about 79, wouldn't it, I think? Yeah, that's about so, right. That's about when I got out. So th 37 years carried you all the way through the Korean War and up until... Through the Cold War and all, yeah. And, and through Vietnam. Yeah. And now, you served on a couple of ships, at least temporarily, that are some pretty important ships. And this was another picture you brought with us here today. <coughs> Enterprise. This is the Enterprise, the Big E. <coughs> tell us, tell us a little bit about your experiences. How'd you come to be there, and, and what was it like, and, and, and when were you there? Did well, you... my experience on it, I uh, was a. Uh, they allowed the reservists to have a two weeks training duty. Uh, on one of the newer ships, I assume, in that, uh, uh, instead of going back to all the old ones, uh, the old destroyers and stuff like that all the time, and they sent us onto this one here. And uh, it was quite an experience. I mean, that's a, you're on there with two or 3,000 sailors and that, and you got a lot of electricians and that, so you, and they give you what they call a running mate, so you do whatever he does and that, and you stand your watches and that like he does and stuff like that. But it was a little, it was different. It was uh, in the, they tell you a place where you can't go and that this where the nuclear was at and that they, you know, they had them all secured off and that and always had somebody standing guard where you couldn't get in there without a special pass and things like that. So but, um, that was about it. it, it you know, it's it's not it's hard to describe what all you do because you do so many different things. I mean I I think that the um, my biggest best experience uh, in the Reserve, though, that was being assigned to the USS Wright, which was a communications ship, and uh, got quite a bit of good experience there for two weeks or so in that. And uh, then I was on the, uh, the Vestal, which was a destroyer, and uh, they were having all kinds of trouble with their electrical system on there, and I got to work on that uh, with electricians that were there, and that we, we solved a problem on that. Now, was that the, the hunt that you were on? Uh, no, that was one of the other ones I've been doing. Oh, okay. so. Because you were also on the hunt for yeah. a while, right? Yeah, I've, yeah. Uh, so the uh, the one you say you fixed the uh, worked on the uh, electrical problems. It was a, a similar ship. Yeah. Yeah. Same well, the right, the right was a, was a converted air, air, one of those mini aircraft oh, carriers that they had like a Jeep during carrier. World War II, Jeep uh, aircraft carrier that they converted over. And uh, I don't know, it's it might still be in service as far as I know. I don't know what this, I, I don't think it is anymore. I think a lot, all those older windows, they're only good for 50 years, I think, or something. They get rid of them. So. Very good. Um, well, this has been just a terrific experience, having a chance to talk to you. One of the things I wanted to ask about was you eventually made Chief Petty Officer. When did that happen, roughly? I think it's somewhere somewhere in the papers here. I don't recall just exactly where, but or the year. But uh, I made that back here in the reserve when it was uh, Reserve Training Center in Cincinnati, I would say probably around uh, maybe in the late 60s, I'm guessing. So you worked up quite a long time with the reserves oh, in, yeah. in, 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 the, in the training and recruiting? Training center, area. yeah. What, uh, what are some of the things you remember about the training and the recruiting aspects of your work? I did it. I did just about everything they required on me. I think I have a list of them in the, that I turned in. It was quite a few different things that I did. I, um, I was in charge of recruiting. I was, you know, uh, I, 
did the 200 uh, anniversary lecture on the, uh, I can't even recall what the name of it was. Sort of history of the Navy. The history of the Navy and that on, and, and uh, but I did many different things in that. It was really required, I mean, reading it, so it was, whatever they needed somebody at is what they did in that reading the reserve and that thing. But you did it in your field, you didn't do it in something else, I mean, that, um, I was training officer, I was instructor, I mean. Uh, well now, how did, how did all the, the, a lot of people find that the work they do in the military helps in their civilian job. How did, you, how did you make the transition back to civilian life? At the end of the war, you were in the Pacific somewhere? Yeah, we were, we were ready setting off Iwo Jima at the end of the war. We, we were, in fact, we were getting ready to go on to Okinawa uh, when the war was over, when they declared the war over. How did you get back home? Tell us about that process. Uh, okay, but before we do that, how about if you explain some of the campaign ribbons that you have brought with you here on your chief's jacket? Well, the, I guess probably to, you say during the war? Yes, that would be good. Can I put my hand on it? Certainly. Yeah, just talk okay. to me. So, well, let's see. This is the, uh, I think this is the American defense. That's the uh, American campaign. That's the Asiatic Pacific, the victory. That's the Armed Forces Reserve Medal. This is the Meritorious Reserve Medal, a ribbon. This is the uh, Naval Reserve Ribbon, and this is the Good Conduct Ribbon. So that's all of the ribbons that are there. I mean, they're, they're, they were in different ways than that. I mean, not just the Meritorious Reserve Medal was because of all my time in reserve and that and what I did do and that. But, um, I'm going to ask him to explain. Would you explain oh, all the different ratings here? The first one over here is the, that was in the, in boot camp at the Great Lakes. I was a squad leader, so I got that one. And the other rating badges was, is petty officers as you advanced. I mean, you've got a different stripe each time. The first one over here is the second class and the, First class it is in the white. I mean, that they got. I don't have the chief in the white, but uh, that's there. Those are. That's the first class in electrician. This is the chief, of, old chief electrician here. This. They took that one off and put the new one on. It's so. earned for. Every three years or so that you're in the service and that you get one. What is it? It's hash marks, they call them. I don't know what the official name is for them, but they call them hash marks. <laughs> and they're, they're different rated. I mean, the red is just, you get and it, you can get that, but you're, good con you're, you're not a good conduct. Maybe something happened. And these here are for good conduct, and they're all, everything is in gold, and so, so that's the way, that's how to distinguish the two. I don't know whether they still do it or not. So, so these were all the awards and the insignia that you received during the war. We were, we were going to also talk a little bit about uh, the, the transition back to civilian life. How did you get from the Pacific back home? Tell us about that trip. Uh, when the war ended, I mean, uh, uh, and our ship had orders that they were going to move on and that, they had to take everybody. I, I think an order came through that everybody that had so many points had to, to be taken off the ships if they had replacements for them right away to be shipped back to the to States for discharge. And actually being out of the States for over to three years in that, I mean, I had a lot of points accumulated in that, and um, I was just wanted to, I think there were three of us on, our, on the ship I was on that were bounced or taken off right away at Iwo Jima. We were put there at the base of Iwo Jima and said we would be transported back to the States as soon as the ship came in to pick us up, because the ship I was on was leaving. 
and uh, I guess we were there probably no more than a week, and we got word that the USS Chester was was heading back to, to the uh, states and that, and that uh, she had room for so many, and they would pick up the ones that had the point system. Uh, I don't remember how many points she had to have, but uh, it was quite a few. So I got one of the billets on there then, and that's where we came back into San Francisco then, uh, on the USS Chester. And then we went over to Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton was supposed to be our uh, stopping point before our separation center, which was the Great Lakes. So they put us in there until they got transportation back to the Great Lakes. And then we came on back to the Great Lakes, and that's where I was separated from the active duty then and to the reserve situation. So, and, uh, and in the civilian life, I had no, I really had no problem with it myself because I had never worked at anything else outside of being an electrician. I went through electrical trade school. I went aboard uh, in the Navy and that and wound up as an electrician's helper and that, in a job at Wright's and that, and into the Navy and that. And so I just, my whole life was being an electrician. I, uh, I don't think I could do much of anything else. But, uh, and, uh, well, well, I came back to Cincinnati then, and actually, uh, did, uh, it was uh, it was rough. I mean, because naturally being gone so long and that all and, and that for I think it's really hard on everybody, regardless of whether who you are or when it is, and that to, to, uh, to come back after that transition of back into a routine life and that uh, different than what you were in but, uh, it uh, wasn't too bad because it just uh, I got a, two or three jobs in there I mean I went to work at the US playing card as electrician and that and I said they were going in transition of uh, so, Laying everybody off because they weren't they weren't making any money now because the war was over with and that so they started laying people off. I was bounced over there to uh, and Ivor Valve and that uh, his electrician there and uh, they had new management takeover so there wasn't any job there anymore and I just figured well it's time for me to make up my mind what I'm going to do myself and that and not wait for somebody to tell me that I, I'm not working or not working. So I applied for a job at the Sensei Public School System and uh, being a civil service job, uh, uh, I was accepted and got the job in there as an electrician at the civil service there. And I was, with my military time counted and all, I put about 32 years in with the Sensei Public Schools as an electrician. So. And at the time we had 113 buildings to take care of, about 10 electricians, so it, uh, it Worked out pretty good. Kept you busy. Uh, kept us busy all the time and that. Uh, actually, in the lean years, I mean, there were lean years where we went down to five electricians and that because we didn't have money from the taxpayers to keep us going, so. Uh, but we managed it. Good experience for me because out of the uh, crew that we had, I mean, it was a fellow was an electrician in the CBs. It was a. Remember his name? Uh, Ralph Hake was his name. Then we had um, Robert Ridings. He was a electrician on the, um, I believe he was on the Antietam, which was an aircraft carrier. Uh, it was a uh, another electric, another electrician in there, and uh, Bill Wagner and. Bill Wagner was from World War I, and he invited us to his house one time to just see just how great he really was, I'm sure, is what he did it for. And for a man that was never highly educated on anything outside of reading a newspaper, that he helped him develop Norfolk Naval Shipyard. He was very brainy, very smart man. So they're all gone now, though. Except, well, Bob Ryan is still around, but um, actually, after that, there's 
few electricians came in and out. And they weren't. They were all right. They weren't Navy people. They were all right. <laughs> well, of, of one last question, and that is, of all the experiences you had in the Navy, which one brings back the most pleasant memories for you? Was it the time you got your, your chief's rating? Was it the time you graduated from basic at, at uh, Great Lakes? What, what one stands out as the, the best experience of all the experiences that you had in the Navy? I don't know what kind of, what you're talking about when you say the best experience of well. what I had in the Navy and that. Uh, I would, I'll, I'll relate to that in a minute, but I think that the best feeling that I ever had was when the war was over and they told me I was going home. I mean, that was the feeling that I think all of us had then. Uh, actually, we didn't get involved in the celebrations that they had in New York and and all the other ones in that because uh, we came, uh, came in, we, we were recognized, but uh, not like the rest of them. I mean, praying down the streets and all the stuff like that. Uh, they had the Navy band in, in San Francisco playing, I mean, when we came in, and that, that was about it right there. And that's it. I mean, uh, if, if you were from San Francisco, your wife or somebody was there at the pier, but if you were from any place else, they didn't know it. We never knew when we were going to be out get out of it anyway, so we, I never notified my wife at all until I found out for sure just exactly when it was going to be done. Now that's something we didn't mention. Uh, where, where did you acquire a wife in all of this? Uh, in 19, my wife and I had planned on getting, getting married anyway, and uh, even with the war on, we planned on it. I uh, uh, have a very unique story about my, how, my, how, my, how I met my wife and that, at the time it had, uh, my mother was a domestic uh, house, housewife and that, and she also uh, told herself out to earn money during the Depression years and that, and she worked for the company she worked for, which was a furniture company, and the secretary of the furniture company who happened to be my future wife, which I didn't know at the time, but my mother came in one time and she said, you know, she said, it's about time that you start dating girls. She said, you're, you're growing out of your teenage, you're, you're already up to 18. She said, you better start thinking about them once in a while and that. And I thought, I wonder what she's talking about. She said, something on her mind and that. And she said, we have the cutest little redhead in our office and that. And said, I know she would love to go out with, with somebody because she never talks about boys. So I thought, well, the best way to do it, it was on Valentine's Day. I went out and got a real funny valentine, put my name on it, all I signed it was Cleve, nothing else, put it in an envelope, mailed it to her and that. And I guess, oh, two or three days later, my mother came into the house one day and that, and she says, you know, she says, I had the funniest thing happen to me today. She said, Dorothy says to me, she says, D isn't Cleve your son? And she says, yeah, and why? says, well, I got a Valentine card from him and that, and I wondered who he was, and it finally dawned on me that I think he was your son. And Mother says, well, why don't you call her up then and ask her for a date now that she knows who you are? <laughs> so I called her up, a uh, little persuasion in that, I guess, and that finally talked her into uh, having a date with me, and, um, and uh, it was quite an experience. I mean, it, uh, so I wound up marrying her, and, uh, and we planned on, as I said, then we started making, as a young teenager and that, I mean, we didn't make plans right away, but as years went on, we planned up in that. And she worked at Wright Aeronautical, too, and she was a secretary to one of the uh, head honchos I, it, out there uh, in the test department. And uh, I don't know, it just, uh, it just seemed to grow on and grow on in that. And uh, we talked about me going into service of that. and. Should we get married or should we put it off or since we planned on it? And she said, well, why don't we, if you want to, just let's go ahead and just do it. And I said, well, I'll see what my mother says and that, my dad, if it's all right with him and that. Mother said, whatever you want to do, you do it, make up your own mind and that. So we had planned on it, so we just went ahead. It was disrupted a little bit, I mean, because we planned on doing it a little earlier and I was going to boot camp, so we put it off until they came home on leave and that. 
and that's when we got married. And, and uh, I think it was around the 19th of uh, October in 42. So you just had an anniversary. So just had it, you know. Very and, good. Uh, but she's been dead for, we were married 46 years, so uh, she died back in 86, I believe it was. But uh, had two children, a son, he was in the Navy too, he was in Vietnam, and, and, um, and a daughter. And the best thing about it, I would say, is that we were all redheads. <laughs> Four redheads, and, and nobody could believe it. <laughs> Good. Very good. Well, that's wonderful. I want to thank you for being here and sharing your stories with us. All your pictures and, and your ratings and your uniform and everything. It's been just wonderful. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we didn't talk about? Well, I, I think that the, the really the thing that uh, it's, it's, it doesn't bother me or anything, but I always, like all of World War II veterans and that, and that we couldn't, we just can't figure out why our country waited so long with recognizing the, I want to say the greatest generation, I mean, whether we were or not, but I, I just don't understand why that everything was going on and that, and they were doing all kinds of monuments and everything else in Washington and that, and all of a sudden they decided that we didn't need anything, and I heard the story that the reason they didn't do it was that the Iwo Jima monument was for World War II veterans, and that was not, that was for the Marines, it definitely was not uh, for us, there was no way it was. But if uh, you get over it, I mean, you don't uh, hold a grudge or anything, which I never did, I don't believe in that, but uh, I was just wondering why we just waited so long to, because we lost so many of them. Uh, I think it was around 16 million plus in the service and that. And by the time the World War II Memorial was built, we were, we were down at probably around 9 million or, or something. So it, uh, but, uh, well, I good experience, good good things have happened. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a negative person. I don't, uh, I try not to believe in things that are negative. I mean, you, you read so much of it in that, but I try not to. Just my own my own opinion, but I think part of it was that it was such a monumental accomplishment, what you and your, your fellow service people did, both men and women that served, that nobody quite understood how it was that we could possibly say thank you. I mean, when you go to Washington and you see all the other monuments, there's monuments to the Civil War, and there's monuments to the Spanish-American War, and there's monuments to World War One, and there's, there's monuments to, like you said, the, the Marine Corps. Well, that's something that you can wrap your arms around, and that's one small little piece. But, but for those of you like you, who were, who, were, who were all the way in places like Dutch Harbor, to, to the middle of Europe, to the South Pacific and Australia, that's such a monumental task. How do you build a monument that big? You have to take in everything. And I've not been there. I've not seen the new World War II monument. But one of my reactions is already, it's not big enough to say thanks for all you've done. It, it is, it's really big enough. If you, if you go there, you'll see that it's big enough because of what they've done. I mean, the, the way they have done the thing makes it big enough. Uh, actually, there's a few things that they maybe missed, I mean, but when you get into something, a large enterprise like that, I mean, there's always somebody going to miss something or something like that. And, uh, but um, it's quite an experience. Uh, uh, my suggestion to anybody that goes to it, and uh, don't go and feel that you're going to see it all in, in a half a day and leave it go at that, but go when you can see it at night when they light it up because that is when it is really beautiful. It really sets the, the whole thing off. No. Now, you were there for the dedication? I was there at the uh, groundbreaking. I was there at the dedication for the whole thing and that. Uh, in fact, I'm a charter member of all of it, so. Did you go by yourself or did you go with somebody? No, uh, we had, uh, I think there were about 11 of us went. Uh, 
some of them took their wives and that. Uh, it was uh, one, two, there was three Navy men, one, one Army man. Uh, they took their wives and that. And I didn't have one to take, but uh, uh, then uh, we had a couple that were grand, uh, son and daughter. Their fathers had been in the service and had, had passed on since then, and they went with us. So but, uh, it was different, quite an experience. But, uh, I, I, I think that uh, if you got uh, just one minute, I, I would like to relate something, though, about the World War II Memorial uh, dedication, uh, which to me was the utmost experience you could have of recognition. Actually, uh, there's 165,000 people there uh, gathered all over the place in that, and we were all there in that, and actually waiting for the ceremonies to start in that, and the word went all the way through us in that that uh, President Bush could not attend because something came up in that. He would not be able to be there in that uh, to uh, open the ceremonies in that, and uh, the moderator, if you want to call him that, uh, stood up there and was talking in that, and then uh, they made their little speeches in that, and uh, everybody was quiet, nobody was saying anything, nobody was doing anything, they were all wondering, minds going every which way in that, and all of a sudden, a guy gets up on the podium in that, and he says, uh, we would like to welcome the President of the United States. He came out of nowhere. All they know is he, he came over there and he came out of nowhere and that. He came walking down through there. He walked up on there. And nobody had said anything about welcoming us there or anything of that. And he said, I'd like to say one thing to start out with. I'd like all World War II veterans to please stand. That did it right there. Because his dad was a World War II veteran too, you know. And so it, I think that was remarkable that he did that. So that he welcomed us right himself and nobody else first. But that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much.